I have to tell you that it is a privilege for me to be here to speak to this group. Um, I told Mr. Oscar earlier that, uh, or I, actually it was Mr. Nathan, I was a little intimidated when they asked me to come and speak to this group because there are so many men in this group that I consider mentors, people that I look up to and admire, people whose advice that I have sought over the years. And to have the opportunity to come and speak to this group uh, is a real privilege. There's also not very many groups I still go to that as a 48-year-old man, I'm referred to as a young man, so I appreciate that, Mr. Warwick. <laughs> but I want to talk to you today about perseverance. Perseverance. How many of you in this room have ever felt God calling you to something? Whether it's a change in your life, a change in your career, you have felt God leading you in a direction that you needed to follow. That's a pretty awesome experience if you've ever felt that. But it's also an experience that really causes you question. To pause and stop and think, is this really God's will for me? Is this really God's leadership? Or is this just something that I want to pursue because I want to pursue it? You know, trying to discern what is and what is not God's direction for your life. That is not an easy task. As Mr. Warwick told you, I started out practicing law in Burgall in a solo practice. I knew from the time I was in high school that I wanted to be a lawyer, despite the fact that I was raised in a Christian home. <laughs> and Tom Jasky and Scott Sherman and other lawyers in the group can attest to the fact that it is possible to be a lawyer and a Christian. But being a lawyer was my goal. That's what I wanted to be. And I loved practicing law, especially in a small town, because you really got to help people. You got a, a chance to invest yourselves in the lives of these folks. And in a town like Burgall, you're still the family attorney. Everything they need, they come to you for. So you got to invest in these people's lives. I didn't come into the practice of law thinking, I want to be a judge. But after about 10 years of practicing law, around 2005, um, there was a district court race coming up on the ballot the next year. And I really felt a pull from God that you need to run for this seat. In this district, you have to name your opponent. You don't just run because you want to run. You run and you're taking on an incumbent if you're running against an incumbent. And I took on in 2006 an incumbent district court judge. I spent a lot of time in prayer before I made that decision. And in thinking through that and in looking back on it even now, trying to discern what was God's direction for me. Anytime you, as a man, sense God's call on your life for something, I think there's a few steps you have to go through. And these are some steps that I took. I am no theologian, but I'm going to tell you from my own experience what I did. The first thing was to submit. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says... I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of worship. And be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. For what purpose? So that you will know what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. So the first step in that process is submitting your life to God as a sacrifice to Him. At the point that you're willing to surrender to God's leadership in your life. Not dictating to God what you will do, but waiting for God to direct you. That was the first step. The second step for me was to read. Not just anything, but to really meditate and delve into God's Word. Now, back in college, I had started a practice of every day reading a couple of chapters in order to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. 
I didn't start that practice with the best of motives. I was really, at that point, questioning the faith that my parents had raised me in. And I wanted to find out for myself what the Bible said. And I started that practice, and I didn't get through the book of Genesis before God convicted me of what a fool I was for rejecting the things that my parents had raised me in. And I came to understand very clearly that God is in control of the universe. Ever since then, every day, I get up in the morning, I read two to three chapters, and it never fails. There's always a verse that will jump off the page that really has impact and meaning in where I am and my point of life on that given day. And I keep a little spiral-bound notebook next to my chair in the bedroom. And in that spiral-bound notebook, I write down that verse every day. I've got to stack a little spiral-bound notebooks now because I've continued that practice now for a long time. And it's amazing that every time I go back through, different verses come off the page that will impact me based on where I am at that time. But back in 05, I really wanted to make sure that this was God's leading for me. So I spent a lot of time reading. I spent a lot of time praying. You know, you can't really decipher what is God's direction for you unless you're talking to Him. You can't guess at it. The other thing that I did was to seek counsel. God puts you in relationship with other Christian men for a reason. So that you've got men who you know share your faith, who you can sit down with and openly and honestly discuss what's going on in your life and seek input and direction from them. God is not a God of confusion. He's a God of unity. If you seek wise counsel from other men that you know are strong in the faith and you get different answers, that may be a sign that that's not the direction you need to follow. When you go to other men in the faith that you know, spend time in prayer and have a close relationship with God, and the answer you get back from them is the same answer that you've been led to. There's some assurance then that you can move forward. But the last thing that I learned, and I didn't have this one right up front, was being patient. Being patient. You see, in 2005, when I sensed that that's what God was calling me to do, I threw myself into that. My wife was a stay-at-home mom at the time, so she took on the role of my campaign manager. She lined up all of my speaking engagements. I think I hit every Kiwanis and Rotary Club, every Ruritan Club, every community group I could speak to. We spoke to them. We went to every community festival and parade. We had events. There are a lot of people in this room who hosted functions for me, even back in 05 and 06, who helped me on that path. November of 2006, Election Day. I will tell you that if you've never run for public office, there's nothing like it. People often wonder why good people don't run for office. Having run a few campaigns now, I can tell you there's a good reason that good people don't run for office because it absolutely wears you out. It consumes you, even for a local office like district court judge. Not for some statewide race or some congressional race, just a local race. Your time, your finances, your attention are all put on that. And that night in November, as we went down to the Board of Elections to watch the results come in, things looked good. I actually won in Pender County, but for district court judge here, you have to run in Pender and all of New Hanover. So at the end of the night, my opponent carried New Hanover County, and I lost that first race by about 3,000 votes. I was a little demoralized. My wife was very much demoralized. Um, I have to say, she took it a lot harder than I did. So we took a step back, and I thought, well, maybe, maybe I was just wrong. You know, I don't know. I'm sure God had me go through that experience for some reason. Don't know what it was, but I went back, 
and I started my practice. Now back then, I'm sure a lot of you in this room are familiar with K-Love, the radio station. They used to send out these devotionals, these printed devotionals. And one that came up while I was running the campaign was, what's your dream? It says, everybody has a dream, what's yours? If you could do anything, what would it be? Most of us don't achieve great things because we give up, we fall short, we get off track, we settle, or we dream too small. Only two things stand in your way, dreaming it, then doing it. Have you dared to dream, really dream? If something is within your apparent reach, it isn't a dream. If it doesn't stretch you, cost you, or involve risk, it isn't a dream. Dreams change you even as they change the world around you. Maybe you're listening to critical people. Remember the story of Joseph? He dreamed big dreams, God-given dreams. And what was the response of his brothers? They said, look, this dreamer is coming. Let us kill him. People who aren't pursuing their own dreams are usually the first to criticize people who are. So who are you listening to? Maybe you're afraid to dream too big. You don't want to fail. Nobody does. But safe living leads to regret. Theodore Roosevelt said, Far better it is to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to rank with those poor souls who neither enjoy much nor suffer much because they live in the gray twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. What's the worst thing that could happen if you pursue your dream and don't achieve it? You could end up where you are now. And what's the best thing that could happen? You could find yourself in new territory, enjoying new blessings, living the life God meant for you to live. I've held on to that for a long time, and I keep it in my Bible just as a reminder. That was 2006. Another cycle of elections came up in 2008. I didn't sense any calling from God that I needed to run for any race that was on the ballot. Another cycle came up in 2010, another in 2012. I didn't run for anything. I had made obligations to scouting and some other organizations. I was involved with what my children were doing at that time. I didn't sense any direction from God that you need to do this. But in 2014, the judge that I had run against back in 06 retired. And that opened up a seat on the bench. And I felt, again, God was calling me to run for that seat. So once again, we formed our committee. We went out and started holding functions and speaking. We poured ourselves into this thing. A year and a half, we went through the campaign. November of 2006, on election night, all my friends and family around, and we're watching the results come in. And it is close all night long. It is so close. And at the end of the night, on election night, I won that race by 17 votes. I felt okay. Hey, it's close, but I won. <laughs> well, I went in the next morning to court, and a good friend of mine was the, on the Board of Elections in Pender County. He said, Kent, you know it's not over, right? It's like, what do you mean it's not over? He said, no, we still have provisional ballots and absentees they still have to canvass. Two weeks later, they canvassed, and it switched. I was now down by 12 votes. Two weeks later, they had a recount, because one of the commissioner's races in New Hanover County were so close, they had to recount anyway. So we went to the Board of Elections for the paper recount that they had to run through those machines. And I knew exactly what my opponent's number needed to be on that recount for me to win. And when they called out her vote total first, I thought, I won. Hers had changed. Then they called mine out. And mine had changed too. At the end of the night and at the end of the day, I lost that race by five votes. 46,378 votes cast, and I lost by five <laughs> votes. The only thing I could think of was, where's a carload of people that I could have picked up to take to the polls <laughs> to have won this race? But, I don't say this to be braggadocious, but I had a piece 
when I was sitting at the Board of Elections that night, and those results were coming in, I knew that if God wanted me to win that race, nobody was going to keep me out of it. And when that vote total came in, and I was five votes short, I got out of my chair, I walked over to my opponent, I shook her hand, I congratulated her, and I walked out of the front door. I had done everything I could do, and it was clear to me, God did not mean that seat for me. After that race was over, I started getting cards and letters from a lot of people. Encouragement. People were sending me cards and letters saying, Kent, God's got something for you. I, I, I can just sense it. God has got something for you. He's had you go through this for a reason. I went back to practicing law and was perfectly content. There was a song that came out earlier in 2016 by Hillary Swank called Thy Will Be Done. And the song talks about the fact that, hey God, I did what I thought you wanted me to do and it didn't turn out the way it was supposed to. And hey God, this doesn't feel so good. I don't like this. But the song says, at the end of the day, all I can say is, Thy will be done. Thy will be done. So I went back to doing what I did. And in July of 2016, on a Monday morning, Alan Cobb sent out an email that said, effective 30 days from now, I am retiring from my office as a Superior Court judge. About two weeks before I got that email, somebody had approached me about taking on a position that I had never thought to pursue, and I didn't particularly want to pursue it, to be honest with you. But they came to me and said, Kent, we know you, we know your heart, we think this is something that you really ought to pursue. I didn't particularly want to do it, but I talked to my wife about it, I talked to my pastor about it, we prayed about it. And over the weekend, I had decided, you know what, if that's what God wants me to do, then I'll do it. It's not what I sought out, it's not what I particularly want to pursue, but if I can be used, I'm going to do it. That Monday morning is when Alan Cobb sent that email out. I went back to my pastor and said, what is God doing? You know, he, he pulled this other opportunity, and now this thing that I have been waiting for all these years has become available. And my pastor's take on it was, maybe God wanted to see if you were willing to step out of your comfort zone. If you were willing to take on something that you weren't looking for in service. But regardless of what his intention or his plan is, this opportunity is here. You need to pursue it. So I did. Keep in mind now, this is July that he announces, the end of July. We filed the second week of August, and early voting starts in October. He got two months to run a campaign. That 2014 race, God put me in a position where I had a campaign committee, I had a list of donors, and I had a long list of volunteers who had stood in parking lots day in and day out, all the way through early voting, who were willing to do it again. Everything was in place that I needed to be in place for a two-month run at a Superior Court judge's seat. So I decided to file. Not a week after I put it out there that I was going to run for this seat, a good friend of mine who's been a friend for 30 years now called me up and said, Kent, we've supported you in the past. We want to support you again. How much can we give? You want to give a candidate a shot in the arm? You call him and tell him that you and your wife want to max out your contributions to his campaign. I got that call, and I'm going to tell you what, I was on 117 coming from Burgall to Wilmington. I can still remember it now. I pulled over on the side of the road, and I started shouting because I knew very clearly God was putting me in a position where I needed to be to be able to run this race. Everybody said, man, there's going to be 10 or 12 people that are going to file for this seat. You're going to have all kinds of competition. We had three people run. Myself and two other opponents who were very capable, ran strong campaigns. 
But election night in 2016 came. And as we watched the results come in, early voting numbers came in. And I won in New Hanover County by over 200 votes at that point for early voting, which coming out of Pender County is not an easy thing to do. I kept that lead in New Hanover all the way through the night. And Pender County results didn't come in until 11 o'clock that night. But when the Pender County results came in, I won that race by over 8,400 votes. I had never dreamed that Alan Cobb would retire from the Superior Court bench. I didn't even consider it. He's a relatively young man, a lot of you know him. Great help, there's no reason for him to have retired. But he did. And I have to tell you, since I've been on the Superior Court bench now for over a year, it's been an unbelievable blessing. We ride the circuit, so I cover all of southeastern North Carolina. We've got about 12 counties that we cover as part of my division, and they've sent me up as far as Plymouth and Greenville to hold court. We deal with serious felony cases. I tried three murder cases in three months last fall. But God had equipped me for that. I did that in private practice. I feel like God was shaping me and preparing me for what He had. And all he wanted from me was submission and patience. If you look back in the Bible, God made promises to people. And what he required of them was patience. You look at Noah. From the time he entered the ark until the day he left it was one year and ten days cooped up in a giant boat with a bunch of animals. Abraham was 75 years old when God promised him a son. 25 years later at the age of 100, he gave him Isaac. Joseph was 17 years old when he dreamed that dream about his brothers bowing down to him. Over 20 years would pass before he was second in command in Egypt and his brothers in the midst of a famine came and bowed down before him. David was anointed king by Samuel at a very young age. He was told by the prophet, you are the king of Israel. But David never lifted a hand against Saul, even when he had multiple opportunities to, because he acknowledged that God appointed Saul as king, and when God is done with him, then I'll take my seat. I'm going to wait on God's time. He was 30 years old when he finally became king of Israel. You look at Paul. Patience. Despite his Damascus Road experience, he did what God called him to do. He didn't always have success. There were multiple times where he was nearly stoned to death. But he never quit. He persevered. 1 Timothy 4, 7 says, We exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulations or trials bring perseverance. And perseverance, proven character. And proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. That's Romans 5, 3. And in 2 Timothy 4, 7, Paul is giving Timothy his, his swan song, so to speak. But he tells him, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. I want to encourage you today, if you sense God's calling on your life, and things have not turned out the way that you thought they would turn out, be patient. God doesn't promise when His promises will be fulfilled. He just tells you that they will be. If you have prayed, if you have spent time in God's Word, if you have submitted yourself to Him, if you have sought counsel from other Christian men, and you've confirmed that this is where God is leading you, do not give up. No matter what the circumstances, persevere. God will reward your patience and your perseverance. Thank you for your time. I appreciate all of you being here today.